Okay, first I gotta tell everybody out there, don't expect a sterling performance from me. I'm I'm reading this thing. This is a, a, a comic book piece that I did on Tio Macero. And I, I, I'm doing this after having, you know, walked around, trekked around lower Manhattan for, you know, several hours. So I'm kind of wasted, you know. I'm not as young as I used to be. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through this thing once. And if I make any mistakes, because I, I tend to make mistakes when I'm reading aloud, you know, you can f figure it out, I'm sure. You know, so give me a break. OK, here it goes. For over 35 years, I've been going around with snatches of Tio Macero's music in my head, stuff I heard in the 50s, compositions and solos of his that I memorized off records and that keep playing back. So here I have, you know, I'm thinking, of, you know, there's some scat singing going on in my head, you know, which I dare not repeat because I'll screw it up because my rotten pitch. Tio was a great jazz musician, way ahead of his time. Like on his first recordings for debut in Columbia, he was doing startling things, using atonality, 12 and nine tone rows, polytonality, polymetric effects, and more than one tempo at a time. And then I have in parenthesis, he allowed improvisers to play simultaneously, choosing their own tempos, employing a collective improvisation in which each Improviser plays on a different chord sequence and overdubbing and altering tape speeds. The pieces Tio wrote weren't just academic exercise. They were alive, vibrant. More so, I think, than John Lewis's far more publicized third stream works. Tio even featured an accordionist on his debut in Columbia stuff. It was among the most striking features of the sessions. The cat played some exciting shit. His name was Orlando Di Girolamo. But on his debut LP, he used the pseudonym Lanny DJ. They met when both were students in New York City and used to work on jobs together, jazz and non-jazz. And here I have somebody saying, can you guys play Havana Gila? <laughs> and as fine a composer, as T.O. was, he was an even better tenor sax player. His style was extremely original. Like his tone indicated, maybe he listened to Lester Young and maybe Stan Getz. But in other ways, T.O. was such a unique stylist. Harmonically, T.O. was a very advanced soloist. He employed the higher intervals of chords strikingly. He was a brilliant upper register player who could create screamingly emotional effects that Coltrane and Albert Eiler would later use. He varied the color and texture of his tone dramatically and was also a master at dynamic variation. Rhythmically, Tio was also stimulating, accenting unpredictably. He had the respect of a few brilliant musicians during the mid-50s. He and Charlie Mingus worked together closely, but Tio's music was not commercially successful. Okay, Tio at one point was teaching school in New York for $2,700 a year. Simultaneously, he had received a Guggenheim grant, which allowed him to have his experimental classical works performed at Cooper Union. A Columbia record company executive was impressed with what he heard, and he hired Tio as a music editor for $90 a week. Mitch Miller became aware of him and gave him an A&R job. In that respect, the rest is history, i.e. Tio became one of the major jazz A&R men of all time. He supervised the great Miles Davis Columbia recordings and others by Duke Ellington and Thelonious Monk, J.J. Johnson. On top of that, he was doing all this non-jazz stuff like editing Andre Castellanos' arrangements, which was news to me. He kept busy musically playing gigs with Mingus in the 60s, continuing to write a variety of compositions including You Are Cruel, this deceptively simple piece for Lionel Hampton, which elicits some of the best solo work Hampton ever recorded. You'd never believe Hamp could play so thoughtfully in modern. When I called Tio to interview him for this piece, I found that he was still writing and playing. He sent me some of his more recent tapes, which were impressive. And I'm shown here thinking to myself, that's great. He's still working, still being creative. So, Dig, if you haven't guessed it by now, I'm writing about Tio here to draw attention to him. 
but I don't have any illusions about how far or how much good that'll do. I got another part to my plan, though. I'm trying to set up meetings between Tio and some of the really important avant-gardists of today. Guys I know, like John Zorn, Dave Douglas, Anthony Coleman, Roy Nathanson, Mark Ribot, plus Michael Dorff, proprietor of the Knitting Factory. If they get together, maybe they'll work together in some way. Maybe it'll be enjoyable and mutually advantageous for them. Get them some attention. Oh, let me say that T.O. isn't at all bitter about being overlooked all these years. I'm more bitter than he is about it. But what do you think of all these connections I'm trying to make? I'm into networking. I've been talking to Artie Shaw lately in connection with some of his stuff I've been reviewing. He's an amazing cat. Maybe I can get him in on this deal. Blah, blah. All right. That's it.